Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Happy Monday Night Live. Happy October. We are finally in the spooktacular season here. I'm sorry this was so late. This will never happen again. I probably am lying right now, but I am i really don't like to do these Monday Night Live so late because I know everyone's got families and actually do things for a living that are important. Um, the reason I'm so late before I get my big guest on here, uh, I somehow, Fishing and DMV, got elected to the black bass advisory board for the maryland department of wildlife resources it is a board that goes over all the decisions that happens within maryland itself but also the tidal potomac river and they had our big meeting tonight uh, i got the email last week and i kind of mauled over where i wanted to have this responsibility to make decisions like this i thought it was kind of interesting um so yeah, that's uh, that's what I did tonight. So I apologize for being so late with that, but I think it's a huge, uh, it really gives the channel a big bump to help really see how the sausage is made for lack of a better sense and to see what we can actually do to help push it to the next level. Um, but that's not what this is about. What this is about is a guy who everyone knows of him. Like I am almost like Sauron. Like you just, you can't say his name, but when he goes to the boat ramp, you just put your boat back on the trailer and go home. Uh, Without further ado, McCluskey, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm good and you. Thank you for your kind words, but that's not true. <laughs> uh, you, you've you been a busy bee. I, I fish a lot. But congrats, I guess, on the black bass board. I don't know if it's, that's it's, a good, bad thing. It, yeah, I'm. it's a sobering, it, it's really cool that they nominated us to be able to do it, that they think that this thing's actually big enough that it's it's worth putting on there. But I got the, you know, huge shout out to Captain Chaconis and Joe Love, who really helped nominate me for the position. But yeah, so we'll see what happens. Um, I don't think if there's anything I'm allowed, like I'm not talking too much about the meeting because I have a message into them to make sure like what I'm allowed to devolve from the meeting. But as soon as I get that information, I'll start devolving information about how the meeting went and all. But uh, yeah, it's a really cool opportunity to see what we can do for the river. No, it's awesome. And having you kind of as our outlet to hear what's going on behind the scenes will be awesome. Yeah, I think that's what we need is more transparent. It really, really do just so that everyone can communicate with each other because that's something where you see with like the netters and chicken monks and or you know the different limits that they have the snake had a problem whatever it is it's like you just we need to talk and stop bitching but we like to bitch we're good at that uh, we're bass fishermen it's, yeah like comes with I, the I mean come on like i mean like a, like a great conversation it'd be like why six fish on the res but i bet that would create a fight because we can't agree on anything it's it's there so it can be more team involved, which is a good thing. It's good to have more people turn up, but I'm done fighting. Fight. Not that not a, not that anybody was fighting it to begin with. It's just Mikey Fisher does an awesome job running our tournaments, and people like to bitch, like we just said. It's bass fishing. So it, it, it is. It's just it's so amazing how you have a sport for full grown men, but they act like 16 year old girls. But it is maybe it's just human nature, honestly. And, and guys, I know well, hopefully we'll keep the drama to a minimum tonight because I just I've been talking all day and I'm not feeling it. Uh, oh, cut to the chase. <laughs> Damn, you guys get it real quick. Um, Andrew Reddick, oh, cut to the chase. Let's start the uh, <laughs> four facing spinner <laughs> argument. I mean, we've already I mean, we can beat the dead horse some more. if That's what you guys want to do on this episode of like Redskins radio. Um, what is there to say? It's still here. You either get good at it or you don't. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think there's more of an argue, a conversation to be had, not about arguing about it, but like how to get good at it. I think it's so weird. Like, I feel like there's less con, like there's less conversation online about how to get good at forward facing sonar than there is bitching about it, which is a no I, shit. I don't know. That goes back to the transparency thing is like, there's a lot of people who have, don't necessarily know how to use it to its maximum capability, you know, and there's people who just have never watched it. And I mean, I don't, I really don't want to talk about it to be honest with you because it's all I hear anymore, but it's just like you, you stated it perfectly. 
to start it out. It's just like, it's here to stay, learn about it. If you don't you get left behind, I mean, it sucks. Like I've, I've said this before on this podcast, I think it's bad, but it's to bitch about it means just there's no reason to. Could for the people at home, because the last time you were on here, we were just but a wee small channel, and I feel like we've like quadrupled in size since the last time I had an episode, just really with 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 uh, with you on as a as a guest. Um, where did you get started in this, and why is it for the people that know? your name and forward facing sonar go together like peanut butter and jelly. And, and so I do think that needs to have that conversation for better or worse. It's true. That's your brand now. So I, where did all that start? Um, I mean, I just, I just got it was one of the first people to get it. I've spent a lot of time looking at it and God, I hate that you said that <laughs> it just hurts my feelings. Why does it hurt your feelings? It, it... I feel like it, I don't want, I don't want to talk myself up, but it takes away from the traditional fishing as in you can go out there and catch them no matter what. It's just like, Oh, he's got forward facing sonar. He can't, if he can't use forward facing sonar, he's not going to catch them. Mm. That's not just talking about me. That's talking about all these guys who are Millican, who's well known for it. It's just, I don't know, kind of just narrows down what, you can be good at doing I mean, I've just done it so much and I realized that that's how you win and that's how you catch the biggest fish. So that's what I do most of the time. And I do, I really enjoy it. It's so fun. Targeting these fish is awesome. Excuse me. Sorry. I forgot to take that out before we, uh, before we party. Um, but I mean, it's it, like I said, it's really enjoyable. I love doing it, but I don't know. I just don't like being my name being associated with solely forward facing sonar. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I guess back in the day when people started to use like a flipping stick and braid with Denny Brower, they're like, well, if he didn't have that in his hand, he wouldn't be good. And it's just an excuse for people to bitch. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's what it is. But again, it's like, OK, they bitch, but let's look at your bank account. Like, like I mean, in the sense that like all the money that you've won and you've taken their money and they're they're butthurt about it for better or worse. Um, oh. And I don't know. I wouldn't say most. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, so example is like the person that bitched, like I remember Pete Glusick said this, like, uh, was it two or three years ago? He was like, he said he was one of the first people to get the chatter bait, but he just threw it in his boat and never did anything with it. And he got his ass kicked. Uh, same thing happened with the Senko, probably same thing happened with Whopper Lover with so many people. Like there's a trend that comes around and they're dumb enough. They're not the one that bought into Bitcoin. And it was 10 cents and mm -hmm. they bitch you recognize that this was Bitcoin and it's like, Hey, I'm actually going to invest in this shit. Cause I can, you had the pun intended forward view to look at this and be like, I need to get on this train. And so that all in of itself just separated you out from everyone else that you knew this was something that you needed to get good at. I would, I, I didn't really realize it until probably six months down the road of having it, what it was like, it was just, I built the boat in 2021 the one, the one I'm sitting in, like we built it out and everything. And I got the live scope and obviously in 2021, everybody had kind of known about it, but nobody was really transparent about it. Like people were, the pros are still kind of hiding it. They were like, I don't want everybody to have this because it's such a, such an advantage. But yeah, it, it took me like six months probably to really fully realize like why I had gotten it. And that's good that I did get it. But have you ever done a boat walkthrough on this show before? <laughs> no, never. I don't know. It's a mess. <laughs> oh yeah. If you don't want to show it off, we can wait and do it some other time. That's fine too. Um, you, you built this yourself. Yeah. Me and two other buddies, um, my friend, Nick Smallwood and then my old partner, Tyler Foltz, um, two weeks before the tournament started in 2021, 20, my buddy Jose reached out to me cause I was looking for boats and through a friend boat walkthrough. <laughs> You've been in the boat, Andrew. <laughs> um, uh he reached out to me because i he had heard through a, through a friend of a friend that i was looking for a boat and his dad was selling this boat and it was two weeks before the tournament started and me and two other friends we went out to my buddy nick's property in his barn and we knocked the boat out in two weeks that's insane it was a lot of hours yep all right the questions are already coming in so yeah we might have to do the walkthrough tonight oh, we got shane flynn outdoors what is the length and width of the boat so what 1448, but it's a mod V hole. So it kind of, it, it's deceptive on the front. I, I let's see if there's any more questions before I pick the phone up and it's all long, but um, it, it's like kind of deceptive at the front where it kind of 
points back in, but it's still a wide vote. And four, 1448, though, Mod V. And then, guys, as always, uh, with all these live streams, I'll be giving out gift cards to Jake Spate and Tackle for the best questions of the night. And then as my Patreon grows, the size of the prizes will grow as well. So I'm sorry that it's not $100,000 yet. We will get there. Uh, the next question we have is the electronics setup uh, by Shane. Uh, Shane, what are the electronics or all the electronics? Question mark. So, yep. Uh, whenever you're ready, pick up that bad boy and let's just t let's take a oh, look at the front. Yeah, if that was the one comment, he said all electric. Now I got a, I have a nine nine on the back, and that's because of the res, correct? Correct. But when we do the electric only tournaments, I just throw like a, I think it's a thirty um, horsepower or not horsepower. Um, is it horsepower? <laughs> 30 pound thrust that's what it is um, gotcha gotcha not that it helps at all because the boat's pretty wide and heavy but and then that also is the tournament that you guys won which we'll get into a little bit later too i have that up as well um because i want to talk about that whole organization all that shindig but but first uh what is the your electronic setup on the front what are you running on the front i have the i think it's a 93 sv or hd maybe garmin uh, whatever the 2021 model was, I guess I bought it brand new. And then I have the LVS 32 transducer. I have a HDS Gen 2 Touch 7 inch on the front. And then I have an HDS Gen 2 uh, 9 inch on the back on the console. But I don't really use the one on the front as much anymore because it drains the um, the battery for the live scope. So I just, I basically, all it was for, was for waypoints. I don't have a transducer on the front because the, um, if you have a like a downscan 2D transducer on the bottom of your trolling motor, it'll mess with the um, it'll give interference to the live scope transducer sometimes. So I just run the uh, two and one or something like that off the back for the side scan and down scan. That's pretty impressive. And then what battery? What's your battery setup like? Uh, I have two batteries. One is a hundred amp hour um, Chinese lithium. Uh, the, the company's called Wise. It's W E I Z E, and then I have a 50 amp hour in the front for the live scope, and that solely runs a black box in the live scope. Damn! And then that doesn't count trolling motor batteries, correct? So, so you got three for hours for cranking the motor and um, the trolling motor, and that's it. Dude, damn! That's actually pretty efficient. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it works great. Honestly, like I would definitely recommend these batteries. I was using a charger that I shouldn't have used for the first two months of me having the batteries, so that was a problem with keeping a charge throughout the day. But once I purchased an actual lithium battery charger, that was, <laughs> it works. I've gone probably 15 hours on the troll motor with the hundred amp hour and had no problem. And I can run the live scope for probably 12 hours with the 50 amp hour. Holy crap. That's insane. The, the 50 amp hour was a hundred dollars on eBay or on Amazon and the three or the hundred amp hour was 300 bucks. I, I need to make the jump to lithium. I really do. Now that I'm running 360 mega and uh, I got the, the, the 34 uh, forward facing sonar black box, like it just sucks so much juice. And I'm trying to figure out the new setup. And that's, that's where we really get into it. If you watch boat builds on Instagram stuff, we're going to a six battery bank charger at some point. Like I know Minn Kota is going to come out with that. No freaking question in my mind. Cause it's not just like the, the, the black boxes are getting more powerful. I don't know how the hell if you're running three graphs at the front of your boat and two at the back and they're getting to be 16 to 20 inch screens, how you can do it with just three, four bat. I mean, I, hell, I remember when I switched to a, a four battery, a four bank battery charger for my Ranger way back in the day, that was like a crazy idea because everyone just used one battery for everything to be jumped off of. And now five, six, seven, it's insane. Yeah. The whole back of the bass boat is just completely full up with batteries. It seems like, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the the live scope draws a lot of juice, especially the new ones, because they're putting out a stronger beam and it, it, it pulls on it a little bit more than the older transducers. When did things start really clicking for you as an angler with all this technology? I mean, I know that you've been, and then for guys, if, if you haven't known that he's been part of the, I want to say like, the, is it like the tiny boat nation, the electric motor only nation, or just the res community forever? I mean, I'd say like all the above. I would call it the res community, but I've jumped around in Virginia fishing some of their electric only clubs. And I haven't fished the John Boat Elite Trail just because all the tournaments are three and a half, four hours away. And that's Phew. the two day. It really sucks because I wish we had something like that up here that traveled around and we didn't fish the same lake every every tournament, you know. But there's 
the Brez is the only nine nine lake in uh, north of Fredericksburg, I believe, and everything else is electric only around Fredericksburg. So it's just there's no there's no gas motor lakes, which is really unfortunate because some of those lakes they're somewhat big enough, I would say, like Hunting Run, Fredericksburg area. You could probably run a nine nine lake, but Fountainhead is just massive. Yeah, Fountainhead's weird because I know there's lakes that are about the same size that let you just use your outboard in some states. So it's kind of funny that there you're not allowed to. Um, yeah. I, but when with everything that you've gone through and I've, and I've now, now that I've been able to talk to you a little bit more and get to know you and really check your career out, when did things start clicking for you? Or when do you think it, it started to click as an angler? Um, I would say probably 2019 was the first year where at least at Fountainhead, I think um, I don't, I don't have the, um, I don't have the, tr the trophy, but I think it was like 2017 or 2016. I got co-angler of the year for the BFLs and, kind of started jumping into that. And then I took a year off, came back and did finish third place in the co-anglers of the BFLs. But when it really started clicking just with me having my own boat and being able to run around and learn lakes on my own and not be reliant on a boater and a BFL to learn these lakes or a buddy who I jumped into practice with, it, I would say about 2019, probably. So four years. And that's something that's so hard. And I think it's interesting now where you have boats costing a hundred thousand dollars, even more. I mean, the, the, the icon Ikea boat, whatever the hell it's called, it's like over 120,000 without the, the base model. Is that something like when you look at the industry and, and you are conservatively a decent angler on the res, if we want to be conservative, but then you look at it, like the only way you can make the next jump is to like what sell a kidney to get on like do would you want to become a co-angler again or at this point i would say no i mean you got to be on the front right it's it's frustrating being a co-angler sometimes just wanting to make decisions in the bfls and stuff but i get it i mean i, I wouldn't mind jumping in and doing the co-angler thing again but i just really don't like relying on somebody else to make decisions and run to certain things and i mean i've been with boaters who have put me on them and i would have never thought that there was fish there i'm not saying that it's a bad thing to do, be the co-angler thing, but it's just, I don't know. It's, it's sometimes, sometimes it can be frustrating after being able to make the decisions on Fountainhead and now fishing Potomac teams with my partner. And he's really cool about me kind of helping to make decisions and stuff, but Lake Anna winter series, stuff like that. But you kicked some ass on Lake Anna winter series last year. It was awesome. I wish we had fished the full season. We jumped in. I don't know how many tournaments they had fished, but we fished, six and one of them we had really bad boat troubles and truck broke down at the wawa in fredericksburg it was a disaster of a day it was just the lord telling me that it was not a day to go fishing but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a disaster um but yeah it was it was fun five tournaments we finished in the money and all five minus the boat trouble one i think we won two had two second places and a third place so but the, the fish had already moved into the wintering stuff, though, so I'm interested this year because we're going to go down and fish. I think they start in early November, maybe the end of October. I'm not sure. Yes. After the Veterans Day tournament, I believe. Right, chat? Help me out. I think that's what it is. I, I'll link that because I got to get that guy on the show that runs that tournament organization to help like uh, pimp it out before. But uh, yeah, it seems about right. Oh, he um, loved that. He's, I can't remember what his name is, but the guy who runs the Lake Anna Winter Series is awesome. He's a really good dude. He loves having the guys out there. I mean, think about it. It's just slow season on Lake Anna. Nobody's launching, and then he's got 25 boats pop up every Sunday. That's why he does them, like, almost every weekend. It's insane, and it shows you. And that's why, like, I got frustrated. I know everyone has their opinions. That's perfectly fine about Lake Anna and, like, what it can hold. The Toyota Series that happened – a week ago now, two weeks ago, whatever it is, it, it had like 150, 60 boats. When I checked MLF again, like they're not pulling even at that level, a 200 boat tournament. And I'm, I'm sorry. I really do think like Anna could handle that. And I don't think like a Sturgeon Creek or a place like that, it wouldn't be too bad, especially if the fishing is so good. I mean, my God, you have a chance to catch a dirty 30 at Lake Anna right now. You can't do that on the Potomac. No, no, not right now. Maybe in a couple of years. Yeah. You know, respawn. But you can go to Lake Anna any time of the year and catch 30 pounds basically at this point. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. And, and you're already doing that like every weekend on the res, but for everyone else, like, like that's hard. I haven't caught 30 pounds for five fish out there in a tournament. 
Oh, that's right. We got to do the five fish thing. I mean, okay, boohoo. I mean, you're still catching one on average. I think I think John Odenkirk. Hmm? I'm just saying. Don't pump, pump me up too much, man. Well, I just meant I was bumping up the reservoir more than you, just be to be honest. Like, <laughs> yes, the reservoir is amazing. There's 30 pounds in every single creek. Yeah, it's insane. Like for the size of that lake, and that kind of gets into our first topic of the day, which was you know the Res Classic. What are your thoughts on how that went down, your execution, things like that? Last year? You were talking about last year? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was we just picked the right section of the lake, honestly. I think it was just a – we got left alone was a big – a really big part of it. I mean, we saw maybe two or three tournament boats in both days of fishing, and one of them came up the second day. He wasn't, like, in the running for money or anything, and his partner didn't show up the second day. So he's like, I'm just going to go up and fish. But we got we got we picked the right section of the lake. Um, we got lucky that the water had come up to full pool. Normally, the water gets a little bit low during the classic, and there's a couple of teams out there when the water gets really low that they're very difficult to beat, almost almost impossible. Even with what we did last year, it would have been we didn't even break the record for what the classic was one with over two days. I think we had like forty nine pounds over two days. It oh, might have crap might have been 50 pounds i'm not i can't remember but uh i think we we didn't get the highest weight in the classic by like a pound and a half compared to the guys that won it with that weight the year the year prior they did that but the water had been low and they had gotten on what they really like to do and but dude that's we, freaking insane <laughs> holy shit that's a lot of weight I and mean, that's such a small freaking lake for the amount of boats that you draw it's this year i mean 13 boats was what I'd say about what we averaged. And I mean, it was the same thing every tournament. We just got kind of got to fish where we wanted it. In the past, there'd be 25 boats and you'd turn a corner and the point or whatever you were trying to fish would probably have a boat on it. But now it's just kind of almost free reign of where you want to go, minus the major community holes. But that's freaking it. Sorry, reading some comments. So if you guys don't know, so uh, we are talking with, with Mr. McCluskey uh, just to kind of give you kind of like his stats for this year and probably every year so far uh, from the Aquaquan Reservoir. Uh, first tournament, March 12th, first place. March 26th, first place. Uh, he decided he wanted to do it one more time, uh, first place, April. He took a couple of weeks off to go to Boca. Um, and then he was back in August with another first place. And then last, and we're talking about last year, his classic win. And this is all on Occoquan Reservoir, which is probably the number one lake in Northern Virginia right now, at least basically on the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources surveys of fish stocking. Uh, and we're kind of just gearing up to what he did last year and kind of your thoughts, because it's October 2nd and you have the classic coming up this year. And I, this is the first year I actually got to have like what I consider now home body water. Cause I never lived in, in, I lived in Percival, which is not close to the tidal Potomac at all. And you're talking traffic was a nightmare. So even in college when I fished it, I couldn't fish it habitually. Now I fished a, a, a Thursday night tournament series all summer long on the upper Potomac. And so I had a place that I knew really well. And I finally got to experience maybe what you experienced where, you know, a place so well that you can almost screw yourself because you overthink things. And we had our classic this past weekend and I got my ass kicked because I tried to play 40 chess on a checkerboard and I overthought everything. How the hell do you stop yourself from doing that when you're going to have the classic for the 500th tournament this year on it? Like, how do you not melt yourself mentally? Mm. No. I don't just go into it just have, with an open mind, I guess. I mean, I just the lake. I know it seems big. It's the lake is really long, but it's really not that massive. You can run to the one end where you want to fish to the next in 20, 30 minutes, probably I would say. So it's in that aspect, it's, you can get messed up if you spend too much time in one area kind of thing. And that's, that's where I could mess myself up is thinking in years past, if I want to run up to the section of the lake that we did, what we did last year and, where I normally go in the classic is if I spend too much time up there banking on that to play and me being left alone, that could really mess me up if they're not, they just don't want to bite. Cause you can go, that's how, that's how the place is, is one week you go out and one section of the lake is on fire. And the next week you go out and you won't, you'll get two bites and it'll be a pound and a half each. And it's just, 
figuring out which section of the lake based on not seasons because it doesn't really seem seasonal in my opinion it's just dependent on the conditions the lake level the water clarity a bunch of different things but i could yeah it's, i'd say just try, not getting too focused on what i've done in the past like you said like you said it's just keeping keeping an open mind being able to run around and figure out what stage the fish are in where they're where they're sitting if they're grouped up where they're positioned on certain spots. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that go into it. And I think that's really important because I do feel like with, with weekend anglers, people that just fish like the tidal Potomac, Lake Anna, Cheston, the Chick, whatever, and you do that every single weekend, you can positively get into a pattern of behavior. This is the section you're going to fish no matter what, but you can also negatively, like you just keep doing the same thing and you lose opportunities because you're not open to different possibilities. And that's really hard when it's like, well, on this brush pile, I've caught them before they're going to be there and you make bad decisions with those things. That's how and I it, screwed, um, the two day BFL a couple weeks ago. I did you up. fish that? Mm -hmm. Holy shit. I didn't know that dude. Let's talk about that. I had two fish, <laughs> but still, like I, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I, that was probably definitely the worst tournament I've fished all year, and it was just bad decisions. And I just, I, I went into practice on Friday. Yeah, I went went out Friday to practice for the event, and I mean, it was we didn't get out until maybe eight thirty or nine o'clock. But as soon as we put the trolling motor in the water, I mean, we started catching fish, and I had. 15 pounds and left some areas that I was like, I, there's no reason for us to even make another cast. Cause I was fishing in these areas where I could see the fish. It wasn't like I had to catch them to know that they were there. I was looking down and seeing three pounders swimming everywhere. And I'd be like, okay, we're done. And I don't know why. And maybe it was, there was, I think there was a storm off the coast or something when it happened. What, what, for some odd reason, the tide never went out and I was so reliant on that low water so I could catch them where I needed to, that I, I didn't have anything for a higher tide, main river grass or anything like that, that I could go to to get a bite. And I screwed myself and just made bad decisions and bankrolled on one thing and came back to the weigh-in with two little ones that went swimming. What the, would you say that that was a learning experience? Like, what did you learn from that? Not to be so closed minded on what I found in practice and not willing to expand and just try something else during practice. Cause that's what I went out looking to do for practice. Cause low tide was supposed to be at three o'clock and I was my, I think I was the fourth flight and I was due back at three twenty. I'm like, this is perfect. I'm going to have um, whatever happens between the start of the day to one o'clock matters not. And then from one o'clock to three o'clock, I was like, this is going to be my chance to make a check and make it to the second day. And one o'clock rolled around and my best area had a foot and a half more water on it than I've seen in it in the last month. And I was like, I'm, I don't know what to do. But what, what was your game plan though? When it came to, were you trying to just to frog like everybody else in the brother seemed like to do, or did you have some kind of sneaky thing you're trying to implement? I wouldn't necessarily say it was a sneaky thing, but it was, it was different. I was, was see, it I, a live scope and a drop shot? <laughs> <laughs> I trust me. I tried it. I, I caught two in practice doing that in some docks, oh, and I should have gone and do, done it. That's the only place on the Potomac with live scope places in the docks, but um, and only when only the deeper ones that aren't grassed in. But um, shoot, where where was I going? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say what I was doing was super sneaky. I mean, I know people have done it before, and I've done it before, but it was just. I was able to get a lot of bites. Like we fished the Potomac teams, I think two weeks, three weeks prior to that two day BFL we had 17 pounds doing this. And we caught 30, 35 fish all day, but we had the perfect tide for it. The water was super low and it was clear where we were fishing. And that's a bit, that was a big thing too, was the clear water. And when the tide's high, the water can be a little murky and stuff. But once the tide gets out, like I didn't even care if it was slack tide, slack low tide, I was still catching them. The Potomac teams, you know, and I've had Mr. Petty on too. It's so interesting when you get a group of anglers that this is all they do is basically fish the river. Is that a good reflection 
is that comparable to the BFL weights, the Toyota weights, or is that a an anomaly? Because you have guys that live on that place. They know that place so damn well that, yeah, of course they're going to catch more. Like, would you compare, if you had a tournament one weekend with Potomac teams and the tournament next week with a Toyota series, would you be like, yeah, these are comparable? Or is it always like, give, yeah, you know, subtract two or three pounds from whatever the winning weight is for Potomac teams? And you got your Toyota weights. Hey. I'd say to subtract a pound or two, maybe. I mean, the guys who come here fishing at Toyota are amazing fishermen. But with the lack of maybe constant tidal fishery experience, like you said, like all these guys do is they're river rats. All they do is go to the Potomac. They spend, as I mean, the guys who this, they call them the Stafford boys, all they do is launch up and fish down there. So it's like you have the guys who are going to have constant knowledge and they're always. They put up big weights. I'd be interested to see what the weights were for like a Potomac teams a week prior to like Toyota series or something like that from this year. I'm not sure what it was, but you're going to have the outlier from um, Matt strike. Will just take me. Oh if boy. You're watching Matt. It's only Saturday. Um, Matt, what are you saying, bud? Oh, Come on. I asked him if he, uh, don't get in his head. Interesting approach. Time frame to get your catches later in the day is bold. Yeah, it was super bold and it screwed me. <laughs> it was bad. It was just that's where I messed up. It was bad decisions and I didn't have anything else to go to. But um, no, Strike was uh, texting me. I asked him to fish the Potomac teams with me next weekend. My partner is going to be at a wedding and uh, he's fishing the regional Thursday and Friday. And hopefully he does not fish with me on Saturday and he's fishing the third day. Mm -hmm. That's what I told him. I was like, dude, I'd much rather you fish the third day of a regional than fish the Potomac teams with me. But if you're going to be up here and you want to fish, um, feel free to jump in. But um, where, were, where was I going? I think we were going to be segueing into your other win, which was with the I, and I, Eric, Eric Weimer. I apologize if I messed up your last name. Virginia <laughs> High Voltage Bass Club. You got that one. You got us. You... <laughs> Holy shit. I can say Baku and I can't, I can't spell bang, but I can do that. Um, you when had a you classic said, tournament. What? When you said Baku, I was like, what is Baku? He's holding a can of bang. <laughs> yeah. For some reason I saw a K when it was upside down. So that shows you why I shouldn't be allowed to drive or read. Um, a huge shout out to Phil. You had the best comment. I think I should, you should win a prize, which is like starts a podcast, but he doesn't know how to read. It's like, yeah, that's, that's about right. Um, where was it going? Oh, I didn't even share my damn screen. That, that would probably help. Let me try that. Uh, I want to show, cause I think this is interesting when you went to fish Abel Lake, which is where it's at. How much experience did you have with that place? I had been there one time and it was on Wednesday before the tournament. So a little, little backstory before, before, uh, Matt gives us our breakdown. He had a classic. This is a, the Virginia high voltage bass club. You finished in first place. And apparently if I'm not mistaken, you had the biggest bag of the year too. Abel Lake, 16 pounds, 13 ounces, first big fish, five pounds. Um, that's not a bad bag at all on a lot of places. That's not bad at all. I was super happy with it. I mean, for September and me not having a lot of knowledge on the lake, it was I was very pleased. But um I think we I, it was 17 one, but I had a dead fish. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. I think I shocked her to death because um I didn't freeze any ice bottles and it wasn't because I put ice in the live well and the chemicals in the ice. Cause I put an additive catch and release in there and it gets rid of all the chlorine and stuff that that's in there. I mean, I see elite series guys do it all the time, so there's no issue with it, but I put a little too much ice in there when I had filled the live well. And I think I shocked her when I put her in there and it was, she died. I call, I called Russ Hamilton, one of the other tournament directors. And, um, I was like, hey, can we weigh in a dead fish? Because as soon as I put her in the live well, she rolled over and I knew like something was wrong. But um, you, I was like, is he still there? I was like, he's no, no, I'm still I, I was still here. Just uh, trying to do. And this is the thing, guys, that you don't understand. And this is this is I just give you a little glimmer behind the hope when when you are a very small show and you have two people comment. It's one thing when you get 37 to 38, what you're supposed to have is an admin that labels everything. So, you know, which ones you read. And so I'm trying to make sure I label all the wonderful comments, which guys, please keep doing that while also listening while sharing. It, it's called ADHD. It helps really well. Eric is in the chat too. Yeah, he killed it. Yeah, he did. And, and really what I get into is like, when you don't have any 
time on a water and it boom day one you go what was your plan with your teammate about how you're going to attack that day uh luckily i fished with my teammates so we kind of both had an idea mm -hmm. they what we had found and what we were going to kind of focus on i knew with this it, it's not a small lake i think it's about the size i think Burke lake's like 220 acres and this one was like 180 or 200 acres or something oh, crap but it's really narrow so it was, I, I had a, I knew that going into it that the boats, some boats were going to go down to all the way down to the dam because some guys had faster boats based on whatever motor they had on the back, and then some guys were going to hang back. So, excuse me, um, I had planned on fishing like kind of the mid section, not all the way down to the dam, but kind of where it opens up into the wider thing, just based off what I saw on and we found on Wednesday, and I it set up very similarly to the res in the, in the way that there's a lot of really deep trees on basically just straight down rock walls that are sitting in 30 to 40 feet of water hmm. and on the res, the fish don't normally, I mean, obviously fish will still live there in the trees in the morning, but for me, normally the way the fish set up on the res is they don't position themselves in the tops of the trees until later in the afternoon when the sun comes up and even if the sun it's cloudy it's the same thing it's just like in the morning they roam a lot more and in the afternoon they set themselves up in the trees so i had found some other offshore stuff it was um there was two humps and there was a ditch in 15 16 feet of water and i found this i found it in practice but i didn't know what i had found until the tournament day unfortunately mm. I lost the two bites that i got off of it look it worked out in the end but i the, I, it, there was two humps in the ditch and there's not a lot of shad in the lake and the bluegill and the crappie were sitting in the ditch and just giant fish were just roaming in and out and then they would stage i could see them stage on the hump and unfortunately i wasn't on wednesday when i saw the area and found it i didn't realize what i had found so i didn't wasn't really set up that well for it and all i had shane play outdoors he found the spot the spots <laughs> yeah i mean oh just shane flint flint uh fish able lake that's fun. yeah shane flint fishes all those areas down there he's actually oh. um he's got a uh he runs the largest online tournament organization in the world and he has some kind of electric shane am i right you got a sponsorship with electric motors you just buy that damn thing but uh, anyway yeah so he's down there with all those lakes as well that's funny that if, if, if I, I assume he knows what i'm talking about i obviously won't say where it is but um uh yeah it's just like they were positioned on this hump and i lost a five pounder and had another one that was even bigger come come up and just absolutely destroyed my glide bait and came on blue but um but yeah we I, we kind of just plucked away i caught that one big one that ended up dying i think it was like four and a half pounds um early deep on on the glide and um we kind of just pecked away just small ones in that area of the lake that didn't have a lot of lay downs and then 12 o'clock rolled around and i don't have the fastest motor on the front of my boat so i was like okay working our way back so make sure we're make sure we're back in time and we got back to the section of the lake where the deeper trees were and that when we got back there they were set up correctly and i first not the first tree but once we kind of got back into the where the water got a little dirtier because it had just rained and the water rose a lot but um I got one about three and a half pounds on a little, little finesse jig. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but hmm. dirty jigs, finesse jig with a baby Z crow on it. That's all you need. Um, what made you decide on that? Uh, res. Confidence bait from the res. Um, it just, it's five sixteenths ounce, so it falls real slow. And it's just for those fish that are positioned in the tops of the trees. There's two approaches. You can put a weight, a three quarter ounce weight or something heavy straight down past their face, or you can have something just kind of flutter slowly there that you can just kind of hang on the branches and just kind of feel it through real slow. But just in the fall time of the year, I like the lighter jig with the, any, the big Z craw or the baby Z craw. Both of them are money. I throw, that's all I throw basically for a jig, swim jig, chatterbait, all of the, some kind of, Z, some kind of Z craw, but yeah, caught that three and a half, maybe four pounder on the jig, and then went to another another lay down, and I threw the threw that guy. 
Oh, is that the uh, the Matt Stockel like limited edition? No, this is uh, mass produced Chad Chad. Oh, I do have the Matt Stryker limited. No, I don't have the Stryker color. Don't. But uh, yeah, just threw Chad Chad over another deep lay down and caught that five six, and then we had our we had our three big ones at that point, and I think I had another two pounder might might have caught on a drop shot, just kind of fishing down the bank, and at the end of the day, going back um just went down a bank went down the right bank i guess with a frog and caught a three pounder from the last like 10 minutes how did you know to throw a frog oh i threw it all day really oh yeah i'm um, well okay oh you asked how did i know to throw a frog yeah oh just because um, um we had this was the saturday or the sunday after we had the hurricane roll through so we had gotten all that rain and where we launched was way in the back of the main feeder creek and it was real dirty and the water had come up like a foot and everybody knew the water was going to come up. And that's just common knowledge to throw a frog or a top water around shallow cover when the water comes up and gets dirty. But I just, there wasn't a lot of fish doing that. Surprisingly, it was just, hmm. it that's was, interesting. I, I was, I was all jacked up for it. I was like, this is going to be really good. It's, it's going to be super competitive. There's going to be a bunch of guys with, low teens 15 16 17 pounds of win and it'll be close because of that what had happened i mean it's just like the res there's willow grass all over the bank there you would think the water rises and it cools off because it had dropped like 10 degrees from wednesday that the fish are going to push up in the grass and on wood and they're going to be shallower people are just going to be able to catch them just power fishing down the bank but it was not like that second place got had I think 11 and a half pounds or something like that and had a big one, but they were, they stayed where the muddy water was and fish shallow. It, it really just comes down to just your execution. And, and the thing that's so fascinating to me is like, you have a guy like Shane Flynn who lives down there and you in two days probably found one of his spots. And that, that has nothing to do with like, and just to tie this back to forward facing sonar, you're like, Oh, I'm, I made forward facing sonar. That decision wasn't forward facing sonar. Was it? That was your intuition. I would say yes and yes and no. I mean, I found what I found using forward facing sonar, but the stuff, the way I fish the trees minus the jig fish and the frog fish, obviously, I think in the, in the drop shot, the, basically the two glide bait fish, that's forward facing sonar oriented. Like mm -hmm. being, being able to feather a glide bait on the top of a tree and kind of see where you need to sink it to, to get the fish's attention. That's you. You almost not, you don't have to, I mean, you can risk it for the biscuit and throw a $50 over a big lay down and try and count it down. But it's, it's, it was, it was forward facing sonar, how I found what I found for the most part. It definitely agree with that. Where like forward facing sonar helps you not lose baits. I do that a lot of times with my spy bait fishing for, for small mouth when I'm going through either bigger rocks, uh, submerged vegetation, I'll use that to make sure I'm, when I throw guys, here's a secret because the, the shallow water spy bait by dual realis is not out yet. You can use that bigger, that the regular ones, but use your forward facing center to keep it up off the bottom and get your cadence down so you can fish it in shallower water. Um, we got a ton of comments before we get to our next segment here. So we're going to have to beat some of these out cause I do not want to be here till midnight. Um, David Smith. Oh, let's see. Larry Martin runs the veteran day tourney on Lake Anna. I will be getting him on the show to help promote that for him. I know that's coming up here shortly. Uh, let's see. Beaver Hall come to Riverton, Virginia this Saturday. I am holding our last scheduled EPO tournament for two for 2023. Everyone is welcome. $60, eight hours. Oh, uh, man. That sounds like a lot of fun. I would go a hundred percent if we didn't have a Potomac teams this week. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be freaking awesome. I kind of blew off my wife's anniversary for our tournament yesterday. So we're going to do something next weekend. So that was the deal. So I cannot do two weekends in the row of screwing my uh, anniversary. I'm pretty sure that's not good for marriage or I would go. Yeah, um, that's a bummer though. I'd love to go. Dang. Yeah. R Riverton's a lot of fun. I have some good memories fishing up there. That's one of my favorite places to fish around here. hundred percent. Not quite early. It needs to cool off a little bit, but in November, it's fine. Oh, yeah. I mean, you and I are going to go out to Lake Frederick, I think, this winter at some point, because that's another place that can be fire, too, that no one no one fishes. Okay. Um, let's see. Ooh, yeah, we, uh, yeah. That would be fun, too. That place. He, I think he caught four fish over eight pounds out there last year. Mm. Dude, he's putting on a clinic. I mean, his Instagram was insane. Like, this did not look like Northern Virginia fish. 
he was he was killing it. But yeah, you can roll through a bunch of comments. I, I can't see the comments, so I didn't realize there were so many. Uh, well, I'm going to pop them up on your screen here. I think, guys, we're also going to start a GoFundMe to get this guy a laptop, I think, at some point. That'll really help him with his uh, his his angling career. Uh, let's see. Beaver Hall again says, "What's what he's saying separates good fishermen from the rest. Absolutely, yes. It's not just about the forward-facing sonar. It's, it's your ability to actually like use it and interpret it. Uh, read lines at Able are a great area for frog. I didn't know there was that many read lines there. Whole bank has got that that res style willow grass all over it. It looked amazing. It was like I would we would go in between the trees and whatever, and I would pick up a frog. I was like, this is the most froggy looking stuff I've seen because the water was above the grass and it was just perfect. And I had two little ones come up and just kiss my frog all day until the last ten minutes. It blew my mind. Well, I mean, either makes you a gambler to keep throwing the dice that one would hit or a genius that you kept with it that long. It, well, it's just, it's like the glide bait. It's like you throw, it, normally you throw a frog you're on a lake, you're going to get a better than average bite, in my opinion. I mean, you can catch small ones on it too, but it's definitely a, a bigger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So counter arguments this with the glide. If I'm fishing a glide or a jerk bait, I have four facing sonar to tell me if there's something in the area that can hit it. A frog, you have no freak. It's just, it, you're blind casting that's depending yes and no oh my god you see he's not forward facing center but he just figured something else out now um i just lost my place i'm um, forward facing sonar how i mean if, if they're close if you can get them within if the bank is like unable the banks are steep so you can see all the way up to the grass line and this this is a little secret with the four. It may not maybe not a secret, but I've showed this to a lot of people and it's helped with their forward facing sonar. Your transducer needs to be that far underneath the water. I've also heard about flipping it backwards and then flipping the settings to make it cleaner. That too, but you you need to be able to see your bait hit the water. That's a mm -hmm. thing when it comes to this is if you can see where your bait hits the water, like you can see where it splashes, like it, it makes a there's just a bright spot will pop up on the very top. That'll help you find your bait. Like if, if you can't see where your bait splashes and then you pan around, you're looking for a much smaller target. Then if you find the splash and then you can kind of pinpoint where that splash was, find your bait way easier. So raise your transducer up as basically as high as you can to that so that you can find where the bait splashes but with a top water i mean i can watch a buzz bait a frog a walking bait come all the way back to the boat on mine because i have it tilted to at the right angle where it still shows the surface guys i mean i don't that's that's absolutely fantastic information for people because i know everyone asks about how to use forward-facing sonar because that's like a lot of comments that i get and that's the absolute juice um where I've uh, got another Beaver Hall comment. Uh, at Beaver Hall, uh, message me and you'll win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Congratulations, you won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, let's see. You got to adjust with the changes of the season. Very, very many elements come into play. Like this Saturday, uh, we just needed a breeze and boom, eight keepers, but just came up a little short for the win. Biggest thing is mental. I knew the bass were there. Just had to wait them out. The rest of the elements, Mr. DMV, you left too soon. Uh, had you stayed up river. I know it's funny is that area. That's where I won this year. And I, I got like three second places. No, two second places this year. And I got my own head because all those tournaments were four hours and this was eight. And I didn't wait. If I just, the funniest thing when I talked to Nolan Miner, I first started this podcast and he said the biggest difference when I went from a boat to a kayak is you realize you don't have to move to catch fish. And I, I tell people all the time, I feel like you, when you have a boat with a 250 or 225, you feel like I must move because I have the ability to, it screws me more often than not. I've very rarely since college run and gunned and did well compared to when I got in an area and I could just work the area. Yeah, no, then that's, it's, that's where the res has hurt me. In a lot of places, like the Potomac, especially because you know the Potomac, you better sit there all eight hours if you're around fish. Yep, it sucks, <laughs> Bulls, man. Because the res is like pull up, fish a brush pile, leave, pull up, fish a tree, leave, pull up, fish a ledge 10 15 minutes on a, on the trees, it's five minutes, and then we leave. It's just run and gun, run and gun, run and gun, burn as much gas as possible. And it's very not very many lakes are like that. And when you fish the electric only tournaments, you better maximize your time. Because mm -hmm. 
you go all the way down the lake and fish something once, you're not coming back to it if you if you miss your opportunity. That's yeah, a hundred percent. And that's so hard is the stay versus go and figuring that secret sauce out. And you see this a lot when I interview guys that fish Kerr versus the Potomac. And this guy's like, I sat in Madawin for nine hours and didn't move. And Kerr is like, I spent six hundred dollars in petrol. And I think it was Will Nash I had on this show. He did the fall fishing report at Kerr. And he said, like, I'm trying to hit 60 to 80 to 100 spots in a day. And it's like, there are people that fish the Potomac that I don't think can comprehend that. And how do you, if you just fish the Potomac, I don't know how you transition and say, like, I'm going to fish the BFLs. Well, good luck, because that's a different style. <laughs> it it's, is. It's, it's the only time I've noticed where you can run and gun is in the spring. But even then, it's so tide dependent. It's like if you run to another area, the tide's going to be different. Like you run down south and the tide's going to be way lower than it was where you were up north. So it's like the Potomac is very different and it makes things very difficult. Just transitioning techniques and what you know on different bodies of water to come there and just you go into a grass bed, you leave after an hour or so there's two boats around you come back in the, at the end of the day for, with an hour left and they're still sitting there. And then you see their boat weigh in and they had 18 pounds. Like, dude. Yeah. Well, hey. yeah. Then yeah, you catch, yeah. And probably save three times as much money in gas as I did. It is. I, and this is why the Florida guys kick ass. Like I just, um, um, I think this is launching on Wednesday. I interviewed Christian who won the Toyota series over the weekend. And we talked a little bit about that where it's like, it's a Florida thing. I think where you're so used to just sitting and camping because those guys can just notice like, Oh yeah, that's like the Southern strain of Milford. This is coontail. Like they're that in tune to be able to pick out those little details and just camp. And yeah. it, unless you grow up doing and that's what, that's what gives you actually a plus is if you fish the res and the Potomac, you got a taste of two different styles, which will help if you ever want to go out and, um, you know, Sorry. compete at the next level. Got to plug my phone in. Oh, just... you're good. That's what happens with the old phony phones. Let's see. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, West Virginia fisherman. Ask Matt if he is ready for the winter series on Lake Anna. Hell yeah. I'm so pumped up for the winter series. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to get off this, the dreadful Potomac River and stop worrying about this. I want the classic to get here and go away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see Shane float outdoors the shallower you fish the shallower your forward facing turn should be yes I agree I think mm -hmm. say that again yeah how do you mean shallower like shallower yeah. in the water like up above like underneath the water like I was saying Shane Sorry. yeah Shane just clarify, just clarify. it's just it's, it's all uh, I agree with you. Like Shane, yeah, just, just clarify with us a little bit here. That'd be great. Uh, we got Adrian Fishin. Uh, as always, I say, trust the rhythm of the tides. He does say that a lot, doesn't he? I, I don't know what you guys talk about in your personal time, so I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> yeah, he says that. Uh, and then Shane's other comment was underneath the water, of course. Um and guys, don't worry, we're going to be getting into our top baits here shortly. And then my wife said, you mean our anniversary? Oh, did I say your anniversary? Yeah, shit. Sorry. That's my bad. Um, yeah, sometimes just anniversary, not yours. Yeah, I, sometimes I forget that. Uh, let's see. We got last comment, and then we're finally caught up for now. Uh, also, come up to the Fish and Game Club last Sunday in October to fish the Butch Ward Tournament. $110 proceeds to go to the Butch Ward Scholarship Program. Uh, you put your kids through college. All right. Good to know. I'll put a link to that in the episode description as well. And then Where's that tournament? That is uh the upper Potomac, big slack. Oh, cool. I need to come up there and fish one of those tournaments. Yeah, come on out. Yeah. If you ever uh, want to come up this way, I can take you out there. I'll go. That place is uh it's it's interesting. It's it's bigger than it looks. You have to run at 65. It'll probably take you five to ten minutes to get from one end to the other. So it's it's a lot longer than you think. That's um not, and then, I would say that's about fountainhead. Yeah. Really? That makes sense. Yeah. I would say it, it would take you about 10 minutes now to get to the tippy top, like go from basically Woodbridge all the way up to Manassas. It would probably take you 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe. I I, I don't know. I've never done it because we're not allowed to. So I don't know for sure. But I think you could put a big engine on there. Like, cause Matt actually, and you guys don't know this cause this was behind the scenes, but the, the late, the Labor Day weekend tournament, I was about, five seconds away from going with my ranger because i got a hold of a generator that i could put in the back and plug in for my trolling motor but i realized that would have been a nightmare and a half to have that ranger and something die um 
Are you talking I don't about even know where the, a fountainhead? Yeah, like Matt was trying to convince me to fish the fountainhead tournament alone or with my wife. I just don't know where I could have fished with just a trolling motor, though, honestly. You could win every single tournament on Fountainhead if you stuck within eyesight of Fountainhead. All you year. got, didn't you get shit for being on a tracker on that lake? I'm pretty sure oh I'd have gotten yelled God. at. You see my post? Oh yeah. my gosh. I would, I'm so glad you brought this up. I wanted to talk about this. Go for so, it. On Friday afternoon, I meet my buddy at Lake Ridge and he's got an. 17 and a half foot bash tracker. I mean, it's, it's tight with three people on it. It had a 50 horsepower and we launched, we're just on the troll motor. Obviously this is not, you can't use the motor. It's the middle of the day. There's crew boats out there. We're not going to go nuts. Like we're just trolling across the lake. We troll out of Lake Ridge. I fish a little ledge spot out there with them. And this guy comes running, running around the lake going pretty fast, mind you. Um, and I just hear him clearly. He doesn't know that his voice travels very well on the water, even when the motor's on and you're running. And he goes, what the F are all these bass boats doing out here? And our motor's trimmed out of the water. So this is perfectly legal. Like you can go out there. It's fine. Like just don't run around like this. Nothing, like what are you going to, what are you going to do? Like we're just on the trolling motor. And he, he yells this to his buddy sitting right next to him. And I hear it. And I'm, I look up and I'm like, what are you, I just held my arms out. I'm like, what, are, what did you say? Like, what, why, why are you trying to be like this? And he, then he turns around and yells it again. Why the F are all these boats out here? Get the F out of here. Just like screaming at us and like cussing us out. And my buddy Russ initiates, why don't you come over here then? <laughs> and, Jesus Christ. And he, I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. It was just so unneeded. And he just kept going. And then once he got, I don't know, a couple hundred yards away from us, he just, he looked away from us when we were trying to be like, dude, what, like, come over here and talk to us about this. If there's really an issue. Mm -hmm. And he got a couple hundred yards away, turned into the bank and we didn't see nothing of it. Keep fishing. And I see my other buddy out there in his bass boat, Thomas Roby. He probably, he might be watching right now. Um, but I, I talked to him about it and he had a com confrontation with the dude too, saying he was, the guy was just going crazy. And this is a young kid. Like he was, looked like he was in his mid twenties, just going nuts, losing his mind over us just being out there fishing. Like who are who are we hurting? Like are you that bent out of shape and you think that like you own the lake? Like get out of here. You're fishing one of my spots. Like dude, this get over yourself. This is ridiculous. Like you have no standpoint to be mad for somebody being out there fishing on a trolling motor. We're all just out there having a good time. Yeah, and this is something I want to bring up because I, I don't want to take your post out of context, but based on what your post said, and then we'll get back to some of the comments as well. Mm -hmm. That person wasn't a local, was it, or a local angler? Because I think your post was like, you, you, no one's really seen him out there before. Well, I, I mean, I'm out there pretty regularly. I mean, some weeks I, I won't go for a week or two, and I'm sure he's fished the lake before. But I have, I mean, I, he was pretty recognizable. He had long hair. He was young, like I had really good eyesight. So I can see your ass from all the way across the lake. And I, I, I recognize people when I see boats out there for the most part. And I'd never seen him out there. It's was just, that this comment on Instagram? Was that SB fishing? That he was yelling at me? Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> SB fishing. <laughs> Next comment was Adrian fishing. Sorry, I paid that kid to say all that to run you off the juice. Well, Andrew, if you ever actually went fishing, I would have believed that. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. God damn, hot spicy. Ah, uh, West Virginia fisherman. Uh, here's a segue, guys. What's the average depth you catch most of your fish with with forward facing sonar? Ten to fifteen feet, I would say. Uh, I would say since I'm fishing up Potomac right now, it's less than 10 feet because there's not a lot of places that are uh, under that. Yeah. But uh, I mean, that's where it's really like you maximize what it can do. You, I mean, obviously you can go out to 40 feet, but there's nowhere around here that you're fishing in 40 feet of water where you're fishing for fish on the bottom. Yeah. No, I, not, I agree. Not, not, in Northern, not in Northern Virginia. So I've heard people talk about this before and, it was anecdotal until oh, I guess it's still anecdotal when I did it. But recently in the last couple of terms I've fished up at big slack, I've shined the light on them and they have spooked. I'm a hundred percent convinced. I pointed at them and they literally, you turned it. And I've heard people like you and Billy Coles and, and, and Tyler at like, yeah, I say this, but it's, it's a thing. And how, what do you do about that? 
like, is there something that you do trick wise or that you cat, you see them and then you just move the trolling motor away, cast and hope. I, I really think that that's what it's getting to. It's like when you see them and you know that you've made the cast, get, turn it away. And I still don't even think it's going to help that much because they're still going to be hearing that clicking mm -hmm. depending on how close they are to the boat, if they follow your stuff. But I mean, they, they feel it. There's no question. When they get, it, it's getting, it's getting worse and worse. It's getting tougher to catch them looking at it. But the positive out of that is if you don't have it, maybe you're going to get more bites. So. Yeah. That's an interesting way to think about it. I think the distance is going to matter more. I think the new unit Garmin put out there, that big ass one a year ago that can see at like 200 feet or something crazy. I think, I don't think that's the model, but I think the idea is there where it's going to be the next model where you can see out farther. Yeah. I'd, I'd like it to just stop where it's at right now and just call it a day. Stop making new technology. Why? Just It's good enough. It's like, what else? You, if you're going to make it so you can see them at 300 feet, like you can't cast 300 feet. You're not throwing a bait 100 yards. Mm -hmm. It's like just make the picture clear and but it's it it would in the next five to ten years it'll get to the point where it's gonna be hard to catch them when they're when you're shining on them i think i i 100 percent agree with that i think i think it, there's gonna be a secondary application for forward facing sonar so example guys i talked about this i have 360 and i have forward facing sonar it's easier for me to triangulate you can know where the stump is you can point at it with the trolling motor helps you with your casting stuff and i honestly feel like i use it more for that specifically than seeing fish sometimes where it's just to make sure that i am casting straight to the stump that i'm at um yeah, yeah i don't know that's a that's an interesting thing to talk about what are because I, I think it'll be detrimental in the long run 100 percent. that's why i'm pro turn the shit off that's that's a hot take by you dude i just i think it would just go back to i don't like drama and the drama that this crap has caused as long as there's anglers there will be drama like there's drama for 360 there's drama for every like, like we said it before anglers like to complain i mean it sucks but but i i don't know we talked about this at the beginning of the podcast with the elite level fishing and stuff and just hearing what the, some of the elite guys are saying about it and wanting it banned like it's just it's making it hard for dudes to make a living because if you're not one of the top of the guys with forward facing zone art you ain't you don't have a camera in your boat you're not going to qualify for the classic well like, you're going to take you it's starting and maybe it hurt it would hurt the guys that are, have just come up and are really good with live scope if it turned it off but Let's talk I, I about that. I don't know the answer to it. I'm just saying what I've heard through other sources, podcasts, whatever. Just saying that because I mean, if you're not getting a camera in your boat and you're not catching fish regularly, like your sponsors are going to start saying, "What the fuck?" Well, let's. That's where I want to kind of make sure we bring this up because I believe we haven't touched on this yet, which is about sponsorships and making it as an angler. Because some people would say it's that's what's important is to get rid of live scope because it makes it easier to make a living. But then on the same token, if you're a seasoned angler and you're going to Lake Hartwell for the 50th time, you have a distinct advantage too over mm -hmm. a rookie. It's the same thing when the bass opens was like, they're going to the James river for the last 30 years. It felt like, well, clearly be good at the James and then don't suck at Lake Champlain. And you basically get to go to the class like you're, or, or the bass master series. Yeah. Mm hmm. You just have to be decent on the places you're not comfortable and then yeah. really maximize points and execution on the places you're good at. But I mean, a rookie can go to Lake Hartwell now and compete with somebody who's got 25 years of experience, which is that a good thing or a bad thing. Like part of me is like, maybe that's a good thing because it doesn't make for the gatekeeping because let's face it. If yeah. you have, if you were a skeet Reese, and you have 700 sponsors locked down and that's money that goes to no one else. And you haven't done shit for the last six years. Forward facing sonar gives that local guy an advantage to where he can then compete with you and maybe take some of that sponsorship dollars away. And I'm just playing devil's advocate uh, for the mm -hmm. conversation, yeah. but I don't know. Like, and I think it comes down to the sponsorship issue. It really does. Um, the money is locked away for like six people and they control most of the, the money that's out there for these guys. I mean, yeah, you can go get like what five bucks and a ham sandwich for, for some, for some things, but it's not enough to make a living. No, mm -mm. And that's the problem. The payouts aren't good. 
the sponsorship money is getting taken up by the bigger, the, the actual companies like Bassmaster, MLF. Like that's a giant chunk of sponsorship money right there. If you think about it, I mean, it is. I'd be willing to say 50% of the sponsorship money goes to the bass and FLW or MLF and whatever. And that's getting taken away from the anglers and the anglers are the ones who are bringing what's hopefully viewership to, to the platform, you know? So I think the anglers should be way more compensated. Like I get it. There's only X amount of money, inflation, whatever, all that shit going on. But yeah, that's a very controversial time at the, at the top of the top level of bass fishing. It really is. Um, with that said, something not just controversial, and I think who was the one that brought this up? Because there's another segment that we're going to do. Uh, da, 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 da. This is why you got to label these things, Tom. Uh, what are your top baits for the fall on Aquaquan Reservoir? I just picked one of them up. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, Andrew Redding. Andrew. Okay. Here we go. Top three baits for the res. Boom. All right. Segue. Well, everybody, everybody wants to know my juice. Uh, jerk bait. Something shiny, preferably Mega Bass Plus One. Just Why? My preference. Uh, it gets to where the fish are, one. And two, everybody thinks that this is just for getting it deep, which it is. You can wait out a jerk bait and get it to go deeper. But the, the Plus One bill, it, get, it keeps it from getting in the trees. And mm. it gets to the feathering a glide bait or whatever around a tree is that it's just where the fish live. And then it helps if you can bang it off of something and the bill keeps it out of the tree. So Mega Bass Plus One, Vision 110, of course. They just came out with a new one, actually. The um, Japanese, I guess, Mega Bass Japan, I guess. I don't think it's released to the U.S. Hopefully Jenny can get some because that would be awesome. But they just came out with a new uh, Vision designed by the same guy. And obviously, this isn't it. But the tail end is a little bit wider so it, it does something with instead of it being so erratic it keeps it sharp when it, mm. when it pops back and forth apparently this is andrew actually sent me the link to this but um yeah it keeps it from <clears throat> excuse me it keeps it from instead of just like rolling and going crazy which is good sometimes i think i mean they still eat the crap out of this it's not like it's anything bad it's gonna make that much of a difference i think but when it's colder, I feel like it'll help because it'll keep it sharper and it won't make it go so erratic. But uh, And it has good hooks on it. Mega Bass hooks are trash on a Vision 110. You better take them off or you're going to lose them. No, I'm, I'm huge on that, guys. That's, Always that's get extra treble hooks. That's a controversial thing, I know. What, that their treble hooks suck? Mm -hmm. Some people are like, oh, they're great. I love them. I leave them on. Well, it's just like, just get extra travel hooks. Cause guess what? If you like to do cold cranking with rocks and shit and banging rocks in the wintertime, like you're going to, you're going to dull your hooks or oh, you got to change it way, but it's just like, it's crazy to me that you have, you pay $25 for a bait and I got to take another, whatever, two bucks or whatever it is for three more hooks to put on it. It's absurd to me. And I, I, maybe it's just the rod I throw. Cause I know that has a lot to do with it. It's the action of the rod it can make a big difference. The line size. All that stuff, but the rod, I throw a 705 CB. I don't know if that'll be upside down. I doubt you guys can see that, but it's just a Fury 705 CB. Give What's that Uh 10, always. Sometimes I'll throw 12 pound in BizX just because the diameter is pretty similar to the red label 10, which is what I normally throw. Just depending. I mean, it depends what I bought and how cheap I'm feeling, but <laughs> no, normally, normally 10 pound red label. Get a get a bulk thousand yard spool on Amazon for like fifty bucks. Last me all year, but yeah, get with the I put size six triple grips on them, not the heavy, not the short shank ones or the heavy wire ones, just the regular size six triple grips, and it almost sinks just a little bit when it's get the water gets right when your split should be throwing it in the fifties. Mm. It almost does, so I can get like I can get this bait to about twelve feet. And the way and with the forward facing sonar, instead of bombing it out there and having to work it down that fast, I throw the 10 pound and I put the little bit heavier hooks on there just because instead of having to bomb it way past them with the plus one, I can make two or three rips, like hard rips, you know, and I'll get it down to five or six feet just on those two rips sometimes. Wow. So it just it gets down there a lot quicker. 
with the, with the 10 pound and those hooks. And, uh, oh, that's another thing about this, that instead of reeling down your jerk bait, if you want to get it deeper with this, but with the plus one, I don't, obviously I don't, I, I, I don't really mess with too many other jerk baits. I'd throw a rap a, a little bit and then uh lucky craft every now and then. But, um, if you want to get it down faster, don't reel it. Why? It's not designed to be reeled down. There's no, since the bill is so thin, I feel like when you reel it down, it's really just cutting through the water. Just based off what I've seen with the live scope, like I'll, I'll throw it out there 60, 70 feet or whatever, and I'll reel it down. And in the time that I can get it to five feet, I can get it down to like seven or eight just by popping it. Just hmm. going. Like when it hits the water, I, maybe I'll turn the handle a couple of times just to catch, pick up on some slack, but I'll just start going as soon as it hits the water. And that gets that gets max depth. By the time it gets back to the boat, I can have it down in 12 or 13. God, guys, he's giving away the juice here. That's really interesting. I never even thought of that before. Just just something just something I learned with it. And it's just helps it helps to get it down to where it needs to be a little bit quicker. But Travis Luger. I have to give it some juice. Travis Luger, old red. Matt will know what I'm talking oh, that's about. Awesome. Yes. What a great comment. What's up, Travis? Dude, so the the story to old red. Now, Travis is an amazing fisherman. Props to you. You're a stick. But uh, he would have caught him either way. But when uh, he actually kind of turned me on to what I was doing in the last Potomac teams, it was um, similar to what we were doing with the same color, old red, actually. Um, and, but we were fishing this, this certain area based on the time of year. And I was like, man, I got this green pumpkin and red jackhammer, three eighths ounce. And pro they'd probably chew back here. And I gave him the jackhammer and I was, I was back voted. It was fine. I didn't mind watching it. But I got, I got second place in the BFL in the back of his boat with four fish. So it worked out great. But um, yeah. I gave him the jackhammer and he started catching a bunch of fish. We just, caught, I was like, Oh red. Every time he catch one, I'd be like, it's all red. That's why. But it's, it's good. I haven't seen him in a long time. But, no, Travis, shout out and congrats on your boat deal. I know that happened a little bit a while ago, <laughs> but I forgot to reach out because I'm an idiot. Um, what was our next comment? We're going to save that last comment. Um, what, what I see, oh, I, I spy okay. with my little eye something else. I was going to say, I got to keep going with the baits. Yeah. This horrid thing. You hate this, the umbrella rig too? This is the devil that catches five pounders. <laughs> Why do you hate the umbrella rig? It's just a really easy forward facing sonar bait. I, I mean, I love it. It's one of my favorite things to throw. Don't get me wrong. They absolutely, I don't know how good you can see this, but super glue to Kytex on. I doubt you guys can see that. It's probably all chopped up, but it's just, just Kytex just destroyed. And they, they love it. It's so good, especially in the fall because they're getting, they're getting really grouped up on Shad. Like my buddy actually was out on the res today and he FaceTimed me. And he was like, look at this. And he FaceTimed me and pointed his um, phone at the live the live scope. And there's just a ball of shad. And you can just see four or five fish just underneath it, just plowing through it. Wow. It was it was it was it was really cool. But this time of year in the fall, especially they just get ganged up on the balls of bait. And it's just a good presentation to put in front of them. And do but, you prefer throwing an under umbrella rig in the fall or the winter? Because I know we're talking about boogie. Um what he did on Lake Frederick, which was stupid. And that was probably with an A reg. Is it, would you Maybe. pick it better for fall or winter? Um, I would, pref I prefer it in the winter time. Personally, I don't, they just seem to bite it a little bit better, but they still, I mean, I'm, I, you can catch them on it all year. Like the summertime, it works great. The pre-spawn, it's amazing. That's the, the tournament we broke the record this year. I think four of them came on the A rig. But it was the perfect – we had 20-mile-per-hour winds blowing into these rock walls. and I mean, it, you didn't really need live scope for the tournament we broke the record. I mean, there was three 30-pound bags, four 30-pound bags that day. So it was just – we just picked the right area. Like I was talking about earlier, it's just picking the right area of the lake where they've been popping off. And we just – I was just – I would turn the boat, the front of the boat into the wind and cast out to the back of the boat with the a rig and just slow roll it on these rocky points and it would just go boom that's so freaking ah that's so much so, fun it was unbelievable but they, they yeah the pre-spawn's really good i would probably prefer it in the winter and the pre-spawn over the fall but i'm still I'll, I'll still have it in the boat there you guys got it and then we got another comment here uh matthew catlett uh, can't wait to see the A-Rig on the deck of the boat this weekend at the Potomac teams. That would be a <laughs> hell of a trick. I mean, 
I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I have not caught them on an Alabama rig on the Potomac before. Yeah, just fire that over the grass mats. It works, honestly. <laughs> good it's crazy. Lord. But in the in the docks it works really good. Uh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, you can that same same with the jerk bait, but don't tell anybody I told you that. No, it's our secret. What's oh, next? Seven thousand people that'll watch this video. Um what's next? The jig I talked about is really good. Um that finesse jig, just something light to keep it up because the fish are going to suspend whether they're on the bait or they're on the trees or they're on the pole trees, wherever they're just something, something that you can keep in their face. Brought like the, if, if I were to pick a bottom bait, it would be a jig or maybe a shaky head, but the shaky head and a drop shot, I can't get bit on honest. They run away from it. And in, in June and July, you drop it on them. Like you would see some fish on a ledge on a point or whatever, and you could throw the drop shot and they would go to it and, they would eat it not most of the time, but sometimes you could, but the reaction right now, it's like you throw the drop shot and it gets three feet away from them. And they're like, hell no. And they just swim away. It's unbelievable. I, and I've been hearing this. This isn't just on the reds. Like this is a lot of other places that I, my buddies have been fishing saying the same thing. Like they just don't want it. I think the drop shot has been so beaten, pun intended over their head that they are, they're shining away from that. I think the shaky head too. Um, <clears throat> and that's where you're finding stuff like again like guys i mean you know i've i keep talking about it, no one fishes this shit so the spy bait example i've saw that, that i've caught more on that where it's like somebody be throwing a jerk bait i'll clean up behind them with a spy bait it's just like they're so used to a certain couple of baits right now and dude these fish do get educated they really do yeah they, they get really educated but yeah I'm, I'm i mean i'll still obviously have finesse stuff drop shot shaky head and uh hopefully hopefully this guy starts to play I don't know if I've showed you that before. Oh my God. I didn't was somebody used that uh, at the Sabine river either last year or this year, last year, Takumi Ito. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, it's a forward facing sonar bait. I mean, you can still wacky. It's a, it's a, just a really finessey wacky worm and it works good. I've caught some good ones on the res on it, but that'll, that'll play for the suspended ones. Just something real finessey and like eight pound line, just a little Nico worm. What is that? Uh, what's that by your left arm behind there? What are those things? Some swimmies. Um, this would be another one. Now, this is not a stock color, it's a Chad Shad. My buddy Russ got this through one of his buddies that custom paints them. But uh, yeah, I definitely recommend going to Jake's and picking one of these up. Chad Chads. Yeah, the Chad Chads are they're the best resinish bait that you can actually get consistently that's not a thousand dollars. Well, it's this is this is the Spro. The Spro one? This is the plastic one. Mm. And luckily, so they collabed with Spro, KGB did, the Russian Mafia. Um, and luckily it wasn't a copycat. And both both of the custom painted one and the this one are both just spro chat chads. And I have a buddy who was doing some swim bait testing for a company he works for and put them side by side, the custom KGB and then the the spro. And he said the spro swims better. And I I saw the real one in the water compared to the spro too, and I I would would agree. I, I think the plastic and it sinks faster. That's and it's cheaper. Like and that's the thing too is let me see if I get my. I got this one off eBay, and this is the thirty fishing one. And this thing, guys, I bet you could probably buy like four Chad Chads for what I paid for this son of a bitch online. Um, because this, I think they're back ordered by like a year at this point. Hmm. Like this shit can get expensive real quick. I know some. I know some swim bait guys probably hate on me for this, but I do like the Chad Chad. It's uh. Why would they hate on you for that? Well, it's just a, I mean, it's not a custom swim bait. It's mass produced. Bro ah. makes it. And, and I get it. I mean, I'm, I'm with it. I think support the, support the local guys as much as anybody, but it's, it's reasonable. 50 mm -hmm. bucks. If I break 50 bucks off, yeah, I'm going to be devastated, but I can go buy another one. It's like you get these custom baits that are 250 bucks. You break it off. You're going to wait two months for them to drop another one. And you better be on time for the drop or you're not going to get it. Yep. So, and this is a very, a fit, this is a very good tournament size. It's seven inches, but it's really like five and five eighths inches because of the tail. They measure from the tail. Like, 
I've been catching two pounders on this. Like sure. it, it's just, it swims so good. It doesn't blow out very easily. And yeah, they bite it big time. It, I've, been, I've been having some very excellent days. This is, this is the, the chat chat. I mean, that's what I got the two big ones on at Able. What is your setup gear wise for that? Uh, I use a Dobbin 766 Sierra, but it's more like a 765 and a half because it's my mat flipping rod and my big spoon rod. So it's got a little bit of bend in it now. Um, and I've had it for probably five years, but uh, yeah, 766 Dobbin Sierra. You can do the champ, whatever. I could probably be fine with a 765 just a regular heavy, not a mag heavy, just because, I mean, it's almost like a crankbait where you're just pulling into them and you just kind of want the rod to load up. But um, 20 pound line, straight fluorocarbon with an eight, five to one gear ratio. Only 20. Yep. Damn. You can throw this, you can throw this on 17 or 15 if you want and be fine. But, probably. So your, your approach then when you get hooked up with 20, are you boat flipping? Or are you going to need a net boy? Oh yeah. We swing them. God damn, dude. Okay. I yeah. pucker a little bit. <laughs> it's just, it's more fun that way. The seven pounder I caught on Chesden was with 20 on the eight inch mag draft. And he was flopping in the bottom of the boat. Oh my God. He just got too much. That, that one definitely made me pucker a little bit. When I saw how big it was, I was like, oh, this is skeptical. But I saw he had the hook and it was like right in the corner and it was all the way through. I was like, yeah, we're coming in. I don't know if I could do that. Jesus. No, I need at least 30 easily. Yeah. We tie good, good knots. That's why you just tie, tie a polymer knot, a polymer knot and you'll be fine. Or, or that, or that. Like, I never thought of the fall as a big time for glide baits. I, I know the, the spring post spawn area is really, is really good, but that, what yeah. the hell is this? So we got some comments here. Phil asks, what is oh Matt's hair routine? God. I, needed, I knew I needed to put a hat on. That's so funny. Uh, yeah, just jump out of the shower and dry it. That's about it. So yeah. I don't know where to go with that. Uh, for like two weeks. Damn, bro, you make me feel fucking bad about my hair. Put my hat on. Uh, Phil, you can call in next week as Boy Duckett too. We could, uh, yeah. we could use that. We need to get you back on here. Um, yeah. Boy, that is just 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 a like shit. Can we end this? uh i'm telling you man the internet is brutal uh back ordered for uh, back ordered back to a year yeah for the um fish 13 oh, for, the yeah. chat, for the chat chat <laughs> probably no nah, you can get him at jake's yeah jake's and then if, if you don't have them at jake's you can of course go other places too but yeah please try to shop at jake's um and then at least you're keeping 100 percent support small business but you're available yeah and that's the thing too is like i'm not against um Sorry, guys, there's some comments I'm trying to read. Like, it's got all pouring just, through. Uh, at least... Just go one at a time, dude. I got nowhere to be. Let's go. All right, cool. So, uh, at least you keep it 100% real. Yeah, like, the problem I have with these baits, and this is such a good thing, is like, yeah, you need to get involved in these, but you need a gateway drug. And so, mm -hmm. for me to, I was able to afford this, but I ordered this in like April and it came a week ago, this bait here. And I kind of yeah. now do this for a semi living. So I have some money to throw in this stuff, but I could see if you want to get into glide baits, if you're like one of these high schoolers, the Chad chat is fantastic. It's a gateway mm -hmm. drug. You can afford 50. And if you skip this under a dock and it gets, and it explodes, you know, it's great. It's so bucks. and it swim and it's a little more expensive than the S waiver, but I like the profile way more and it swims way better. Yes. Yes. And the S waiver, dude, the S waiver. Yes. I, that's the first one I ever threw. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Tactical bassin. Speaking Bio, of this, you'll catch six pounders. Dude, tactical bass. I know everyone like likes Milliken, but I still think tactical bassin are are kind of the godfathers to me. Uh, least favorite thing about SBTV. I don't know what the hell we're talking about. Are we is, talking about is that Phil? A question or was it something we said? Yeah, is that a question or a statement there? Uh, HB, where's your dad at? uh he does what i mean uh phil i've got a taxi shad and a bottle of hair gel for him to trade for a live scope oh lesson. my god phil. phil tell you what um i i uh i I'll, 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 I'll take the taxi shad how about this let's have a fish off you name the youtube channel that it'll be hosted on it'd be phil versus matt name the location <laughs> 
Let's go walk around a pond. Hunter, you'll win an award for that one. That one was actually pretty funny. Uh, and then Phil, I'll, I'll give you a gift card as well to, to a Jake's bait and tackle oh if you want God. it. And uh, he's just roasting me. Eric. Hey, yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, Matt, you need to catch a giant bass on a rubber dice. Does that shit actually work? Those dice. So I only, I've, I've thrown it a decent amount on the res. So Eric, actually, I got him right here. Eric did something really smart and he made some of his own and they look so good. Oops. It's, I mean, it's just a square piece of plastic with some jig skirt in it. And the idea behind it's awesome. And they follow it. They chase it like crazy. I just can't get them to bite it. That's so weird. That how Again, the Japanese, I love them. How the hell did they figure that out, that that's a thing that would work? Yeah, I don't know. I was looking it, on the back of warehouses. Um, I think G-Crack or G-Crack, they make a bunch of baits that have the same kind of idea where they have, they'll have like a, like a plastic, like uh, I think, I think it's called the not the Yamatanuki from Gary Yamamoto, but one that missile baits makes. It looks like that. It's almost a Ned rig, but it's got this all over the jig skirt all over the mm, back. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they got a bunch of different baits with it like that. It's awesome. I think it's a great idea. I think more people need to adopt the Japanese style of fishing just with the way that it's going with forward facing sonar, like the super finesse stuff and just weird shit that the fish have never seen before. I mean, BFS stuff. I mean, I know I've, I, you and other people and myself have talked about this a lot. Like that is going to be the norm. You're not going to be getting away with 60 pound braid in all these occasions going lighter. I think the tournament that I won with, with my wife, I was fishing five pound leader on my Ned rig. I dropped down really light to get extra bites. I think that stuff does play. Mm -hmm. So, but people are so afraid in this area. They think if you drop down from 20 to 18, that that's finesse and no, you're going to have to go lighter than that. Yeah, no. When, when I know one of my good buddies, he throws 20 pound to 20 pound on a Carolina rig and he wore him out this year. So really? Yeah. Then that was, that surprised me too. Cause when he told me, he was like, yeah, I just go 20 to 20 on my Carolina rig. I was like, you don't go 20 to like 15 or 12. It's like, no, 20 to 20. And he wore him out. He caught him really good. So, I mean, I think there's certain situations that doesn't matter so much with water clarity and depending on how much the lake's getting pressure. But, yeah, stuff like this that Eric makes out of a little ice maker or whatever. He just poured plastic into, like, a little ice cube thing. That's, ins <laughs> that's so, so – now, is he ever going to sell it to the public if he is? Yeah, sure. Eric, sell him. Make him. Yeah, Eric, if you're going to sell them, I'll help I'll help push it for you. Just uh, let me know in the comment section down below. Or just reach out to me. Um, and then, Phil, if you're still there, uh, I will do the fish challenge. I will sponsor that. I'll get uh, I'll get Hunter or someone to be in the boat to video it. That would be a fantastic challenge. We got uh, Jason Riley again. Uh, Phil's a savage. I like him. He's he's tolerable. Um, let's see. I, like, I, like, I, I do enjoy Boyd Duggan Jr. a little bit more than Phil, but we, okay. we will be getting Boyd back on the show at some point when he's of the right mind. Let's see where that other comment I had. When are you going to be facing shallow? This is a good comment from Instagram as I look at the Instagram comments. Uh, when are you going to be switching from shallow to deep, or do you look for both throughout the year? So I Pretty guess much. this part when it cools off in the fall, I mean, you got to look shallow. I mean, you're missing a big opportunity, but I'm still going to focus deep. Pretty much the only time where it's going to be a sole focus on shallow is when they're spawning. When there's some heavy, even even when they're slightly post-spawn is the only time out there that I've noticed where you're not finding fish on the ends of trees and eight to 10 feet of water. Even the ones that are suspended are three or four feet under the surface. Hmm. Like they, they, when they transition to go shallow, it's just all of them do it. They might not be on the bed, but they're not going to be 10 to 15 feet deep. That I've noticed, like the majority of fish, obviously, now I've, that's not 100%. But when I go look at some of the areas for post-spawn fish, until the majority of them get out there, they're not going to get ganged up and really stacked on it. Most of them will be kind of lingering shallow, I feel like. Just res experience with that, at least. But pretty Matt. much never fishing shallow. Yeah, and that's what's so crazy. Like, how many terms have you won without forward facing sonar? You think, or you've done well in? I've done well a, a good a lot. I mean, we were 
close to, if not in the money in the spawning tournaments this year, same as last year before fair forward facing sonar, we won a good amount. So Matt, I mean, again, you got such a wealth of knowledge and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, is there any, is it any closing thoughts? And again, guys, I know it's like 10 o'clock at night going on. I am shocked that we still have 30 people watching. I know we were up to like 50. At one point. Um, I know, I know, I know. I got to still edit a video that goes out tomorrow morning though. Sadly, again, the black bass advisory thing screwed us over here. Um, but yeah, once I get an editor to help me out, this would be a way easier to do. Yeah, put, put Carly to work. Oh my God, I do. She's got to stop doing the short stuff. No one likes the short content. I know I'm going to get yelled at for that one, uh, but oh well. Let me see. Get all the comments. Yeah, we got through everything, guys. This is awesome. I think, guys, I, I, again, I can't thank you enough, uh, everyone that was listening and then Matt, but but Matt, closing thoughts or anything else that you want you want to bring up conversation-wise, topic-wise? No, we covered everything. Just thanks for having me on. There's 30 people watching. We should do it again tomorrow. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm going to be here. I don't do anything. <laughs> I don't do anything else at this point. I said in September I was going to cut back and I literally never did that. So I don't, I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of stuck with this, I guess now indefinitely, which is not a bad thing. I enjoy, I enjoy doing this guys. Um, I'm, I'm eventually going to find a work-life balance or I'll just quit my job and do this full time, which is honestly what I'd, I'd rather be doing. But, uh, but, oh, well, as I continue to ramble here, um, yeah, I drive I think I got to every morning. I need some content to listen to on the regular. So, yeah, where are you working now? Uh, I work for like a security company, um, install security stuff, like card breaker. Like a three letter agency, you get to kill people. No, for no, 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 not not quite yet. I, I do government some government work, but not like that. But. Let's see, Brandon Solis, Tom, you need to fish more tournaments. So. Brandon, I would love to. That means I need to not have two jobs. Um, I, I would love to fish a lot more. I know I got a bunch of guys that want to push me to do that. So once we get some more sponsors and I can not work 100 hours a week, I would really like to. But I mean, it, they're expensive. That's the thing is it's just for me to go to the, to do the Potomac teams, I've been asked to do that. That's a two to three hour drive for me from where I live right now in Hagerstown. It'd be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it really would. Just to get my ass kicked and, and donate money. Like I think I have a better chance of winning a BFL than a Potomac teams because those guys are just freaking sticks that's all they do it is very difficult to win them you just i don't know how like you could, you could with some of those guys and it's, it's a testament to them they're just really fucking that's, good. that's awesome just to see those guys just like god the the wealth of knowledge the amount of hours that have just been spent in a hundred yard stretch of a river you know it just blows my mind it's like you said it's a testament to them but god it sucks just donating my money to them all the time. Not don't we we've, we've cashed in four Potomac teams this year, but that's not we, bad. We haven't won any. I think we're in seventh or eighth place for team of the year, but we're like ten pounds back from the lead. Yeah, that's pretty damn good. So so then with that said, you're doing Potomac teams this year. Do you have anything like special going on next year potentially? Uh Shenandoah BFLs and if Phil's not gonna be a dick, maybe I'll come join them at the Piedmont for some of the Piedmont ones next year. <laughs> I, I want to do the Piedmont too, but it's just so far. It's so far. It, like, that that, it's like, I like the two tournaments on the Potomac. The James is two out, two and change. Smith Mountains is the farthest at four and a half, and then Kerr's three and a half. But if you mu get rid of the Potomac and it's High Rock and Kerr twice, that's a lot of driving, man. And Dude. it sucks that their regional gets to be on the Potomac, but the division that fishes the Potomac twice does not. I mean, yeah. it makes sense. You don't want to stack the field with a bunch of guys who just fished the river division and then get to go on the river for the regional. And then four other divisions are kind of shit out of luck, you know, but, but high rock is far. Like I went and chilled with them there. Like, I was like, Jesus God, like I should have just kept driving to Lake Murray at that point. Cause that place was not like, it was okay, but it was nothing special. And the same thing with Kerr. Like I, it's just, it's so far to drive for that. Like if it was like Potomac level fishing, it's one thing, but it's not. So it really makes it harder to convince myself to burn that much gas to go down there to donate money to you know those local sticks. I think you're selling yourself short here, bud. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a one day, and I've, I've got okay. Do you think if I if I got to pay your entry fee right now, would you have a better chance of winning a Toyota or a BFL? I mean, you would. You know what I would pick? You I have. A, I think. Stuff. I mean, I'm. You want to go with the Toyota because it's going to be a little bit higher class of skilled anglers and it's also it's like or is, is a toyota four days or is it only three days 
It's three days. Okay. And you yeah. can make adjustments. Yeah, but you can you can make adjustments after one day. I mean, I I don't know. That's tough, man. I mean, if you get on if you get on them on practice, say Thursday and Friday before BFL, if you're lucky enough to practice for two days before it, it's a lot easier to stay on them for a day than it is three days. True, but then let's this is the counter argument. This is the way I heard it was you can roll out of bed, go to Smith Mountain Lake with a mag draft in April and get lucky for a BFL. You can't really do that three days in a row for Toyota. Yeah. And that's the difference is these guys that fish the BFL, and I'm not trying to take away from how good they are, but you get lucky and you smack that 23 pound bag. Can you back it up the next day? And a lot of times they don't. And you see that how many times on bass, MLF, whatever, one guy cracks a mega bag and then he's not even in the top 10 by the end of the tournament because it was, he did get lucky that one day. And I think that's where that's where you're a true fisherman is you can make the changes. And yeah, you average. Maybe you never caught 25 pounds, but you caught 17 every day. And guess what? You just won the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the decision making and making the adjustments. And I feel like the multi-day events, you get to actually test that part of your brain out that you can on a BFL. You don't get to hit the conditions differently and make those adjustments where the Hobie series, at least, which I'm really convinced I might fish that next year. At least I get to fish two days for 300 bucks, mm -hmm. which is the same amount as a BFL. And I don't have to burn petrol and I get a better payback. So yeah, I, payback would definitely be better with that. I'm sure. Where's, yeah. where's that tournament? The, those tournaments are all, they haven't announced the schedule yet, but they were like at the Susquehanna river, the new river with the two closer ones, Cayuga. So I was thinking about hopping a couple of those. And that's the other thing too, with the kayak tournaments, I could fish hunting run or upper Potomac, Shenandoah, places like that and, and make some money back actually. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. That's, you fish a kayak tournament though. Well, yeah. You got to go to bed. Uh, shit. Probably do. Anyway, guys, uh, this will be, uh, this will be dropped tomorrow morning. Uh, like subscribe to the channel. Uh, Matt's, Link to all of his stuff will be in the comment section as well. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.